please welcome Alex James. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I know it's early and some of us were late. Uh, were up late very, uh, very late last night. So um, I'm going to talk about AI ap applications. And it's funny because um, we had an email exchange with Johannes about, yeah, I was like, give me your slides. I want to know what you're going to talk about so we don't overlap. And we, we fought the fight and we didn't share the slides, which is good because there's a little bit of overlap. And it makes sense because we work in, in, in the same field. So I started with this, which you also had on your, on your slides, but I have a slightly different take on it. Um, but I think it's really, really important because we talk a lot about AI and you know, people are freaking out about losing jobs and X, Y, and Z, and you know, there's a lot of deep learning and you know, there's applications coming out almost on a daily basis of new things that are being done in machine learning. But we're not thinking enough about this question. What is really intelligence? And you know, you can take the most basic definition. Um, that's this one. You know, the ability to understand and learn well, and to form judgments and opinions based on reason. Now, if you take that just that basic definition and you think about it, you realize that this is pretty complex, right? Like, what does understand mean, even? What does form judgments mean and opinions? When you talk to people, sometimes you're like, do you not understand what I'm telling you, <laughs> right? So humans don't always act this way. They don't always form judgments and opinions based on reason nor facts. So it's pretty fascinating that we're trying to create machines that are intelligent when we don't even know what the real definition of intelligence is. And we can go deeper and look at more definitions, and you had an, an amazing list of them. I just took two more. Um, one's capacity for logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, emotional knowledge, planning, creativity, and problem solving. Again, if you take any of these individually, it's pretty hard to, to really define it, right? In mathematical terms, even. Um, in, and even if you did, you could argue that having one of these alone is not sufficient. You need a whole bunch of them, depending on the context, the problem you're trying to solve, et cetera, et cetera, who you're interacting with, and so on and so forth. So when you think about it that way, I think it's easy to realize that this vision of AI as really intelligent machines, the way that we think of intelligence maybe in humans, is really pretty far away. I would argue, right? And then if you look at this, and this is a you know oversimplified graph that, that shows you what the field might look like. So I would define AI as a, a huge field with many, many disciplines. Machine learning, learning is one of those subfields. And then deep learning would be yet another subfield of, of machine learning. And I was having a conversation with someone over beer last night, and he was arguing that deep learning was not a subset of uh, machine learning because the methods are different and so on and so forth. And yeah, there are many ways of classifying this. But in essence, if what you're doing is classifying objects or entities or whatever it is, um, then you can say that, yeah, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, right? It's just a family of algorithms that have certain properties that are different from the more traditional algorithms. But that's that's a big part of it, right, of machine learning and, and AI. And one could argue intelligence and creativity. Um, when you think about creativity, for example, you don't want to be too different because if you're too different, it, it, you stop making sense, right? Like, we all want to be unique and we, like fashion is one example, right? We, we might dress in a certain way, if, but we want to look like other people as well, right? So we want to be unique within a specific tribe, which if we looked at it in a graph like this, it would basically mean we're not completely an outlier. You know, we're going to be in a cluster that is similar to us in some way. And in terms of creativity, what you want to do is be at sort of at the edge where you're not too weird, because if you're too weird, you're not, you know, it's not creative enough, right? But you want to be different from the rest. So it's, it's a fine line, it's, it's complicated. 
So anyway, if we look at this, then we realize that AI, um, you know, in that grander vision, really includes things that are more human-like. Um, and that includes physical interaction, natural language processing, HCI, philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So many, many fields outside of what we think of as you know, just AI and machine learning. So that's really important to, to keep in mind because we, we, I think we forget that. And we're calling everything in deep learning AI as if that was it. But there's so much more that hasn't even been, been touched upon yet. Um, so the other thing that I think is really fascinating about this is if we think about Turing and, and his definition, right? And, and you know, he started with the questions, can machines think? And then he realized, well, that's too hard. Like, how do we quantify that? So then he switched it to, are there imaginable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? And if you think about this, it's really fascinating because there's a very important word in, in this question, and that's imitation. And the reason that it's important is because it, it includes the human, right? So it's as much about what the machine can do as it is about the human's perception of what the machine can do. And that's really critical because as, as smart as we are and as intelligent as we are, we're very easily fooled. So you could argue that it's easy to make a machine that will pass the imitation game because we're pretty easy to fool. And it's been done before. And so in many ways, yeah, we've already achieved AI. We've created machines that are intelligent based on that definition. So I'll give you one example. And, um, so, and most of you might have seen this already, ELISA, which was an early system from the 1960s. So it was a rule-based therapist um, that you would have a conversation with online by typing. And it was very basic, you know, it would just take, it was all based on rules that were written by hand and it would just take a sentence that you gave it and flip it around. And so, it, you know, here, here's an example. Um, it would, you know, sometimes just say, in what way? Like no matter what you said to it, it would say, in what way, for example. And that would lead you to say something else and then it would extract something and turn it around. And people were fooled by this and they really thought that they were speaking to a human, right? So the, the point that I wanted to make with this one specifically is, these ideas have been around for a long time, um, and you don't always need the most sophisticated techniques to be able to fool humans and create AI. Right? A, a basic program like this can fool a human and, and be AI. So it's, it's interesting. Having said that, the other thing that's really fascinating is that I think computing is now AI. If, I'm, if I you know, take a loose definition and I say AI is machine learning, so you know, I'm, just, I'm just narrowing it down and say everything that is machine learning is AI. And the reason I'm saying that is, like, how many of you have cell phones? Raise your hand. Pretty much everybody. I do have a couple of friends that don't have cell phones, so you shouldn't be surprised by the, by the uh, question. How many of you um, do AI? or use AI on a daily basis, raise your hand. Almost everybody, that's good, because you guys are the more technical crowd, right? So yeah, we use AI every day already because we have phones, we're searching the web, right? We're taking taxis, we're getting milk at the supermarket. The chances that there is machine learning at some point in whatever you do every single day are pretty high, right? And that's, that's fascinating because even with all the talk about AI and machine learning, I think most people don't realize that it's already here. We're already using it on a daily basis and most of the products that we use already have some form of intelligence or at least machine learning. And we are all contributing to this by giving our data, right, and using these products. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Now, in reality, you know, when we think about businesses and uh, developers and so on and so forth, you know, the question is often, you know, where can I use AI? How can I apply it? You know, what are the opportunities? Because when you read all these papers about deep learning and, and style transfer and generating music and all that stuff, recognizing cats, um, you know, it sounds great, but if you're a small company, you're like, okay, but now what? <laughs> like, how do I, 
what do I do with this? You know, how do I build a data science team? How do I get machine learning into my company? What do I need to do? Where can I apply it? And that's a question that I get a lot, and, I, and I'm sure some of you get as well. So just a very basic definition, I would say, you know, anywhere where repetitive patterns can be measured and where prediction is useful, right? As long as you can measure stuff, you can train an algorithm to make predictions. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So the other thing that's interesting is, I would argue that it's no longer really important if computers can imitate like humans. Imitate humans, right? Um, let's, let's think of you know, a calculator, right? It doesn't really imitate a human, it's a lot better than a human, right? You can type in a huge number, you'll get an answer immediately. No human will do that. And so, in some ways, you know, this notion of the imitation game, you could argue, is, is misguided because what we're doing goes way beyond that. And a lot of the tools that we have and we'll continue to develop are really about doing stuff in which humans are not that good at. And, and so not necessarily just imitating humans. So I think there's, there, there are kind of two sides to the coin. One is, um, you know, just as, as I just said, doing stuff that's better than, than what humans do. So, you know, our AI of the future should, do, should be better than, than, than humans. So let's not just try to imitate humans, let's do better than humans. That's, that's really the goal, and, and we're already doing that, right? Cars are better than us at, at moving, in some sense, right? We, we have more, uh, we're more agile than, than a big car. You know, we can jump, we can do all, all kinds of things, we're more flexible. So, technology, I think, will continue to develop in that same way, in which, in very narrow ways, it is a lot better than, than we are, but we're, we're still a lot more flexible. Right and and more adaptable and you know it always amazes me to see the kinds of things that we humans can do when you you know when you look at sports or you go to the circus you know you see people doing incredible things that you would say like that's amazing that the body can do this or the mind right so anyway now I'm going to go a little bit into sort of the types of applications that I think benefit from machine learning more specifically now I'm going to go back to machine learning and not so much the super hyped AI. And I often talk about these in the, in the context of big data, but they're tightly linked. So the first one is design. So I think design is, is very tightly linked to machine learning. Algorithmic, in terms of developing new algorithms to do whatever you can imagine. And I'll give some examples. User insights, which are more individual. Socioeconomic, which are more macro understanding how populations of people do things or, or large groups of people do things. Um, and then personal insights, which I think is sort of the next big frontier and where we're very much um, in, in the infancy of technology. So design. Design is really, really critical. I mean, it's, it's, it impacts everything that we do. If we think about technology and where we are today in technology, I would argue that one of the main reasons that we have everything that we have is because there have been advances in design. You know, without the iPhone and a lot of the work that Apple has done in design over the years, um, I don't know, you know, where we would be. And it, of course, it's not just Apple, you know, it's a lot of people in, in the community doing, doing that. So I often talk about this and I, and I refer to this human-centric computing. And the basic idea is that user experience, data analysis, and what I call human aspects are really critical and we need to take all of these into account and apply machine learning at that intersection of, of those three things. And you know, it's, it's pretty basic. If you take the design of any, any product, you know, take an app, uh, not an app as in sleeping, an app as on the phone, right? And you change something on the app, the design changes, then what the user will do will change, even if it's a minor change, right? And that will impact the data that you see in the algorithms that you build and, and so on and so forth. So the answer, I think, in developing the AI of the future and, and machine learning to be effective um, in terms of building stuff into products and having a real impact is mixing qualitative and quantitative methods. So here's an example of some of the methods that I use in a lot of my work. Um, informal interviews, focus groups, 
focus groups, you basically get smaller groups of people to give you feedback on a prototype, whether it's um, drawn on paper or it's a web prototype or whatever it is. Surveys, crowdsourcing, like Mechanical Turk. Um, is everyone familiar with Wizard of Oz techniques? No. So it's, it's a technique that was um, invented, I think, like in the 60s, again, in the, in the context of natural language um, understanding and processing, like the ELISA example. So what they, what they would do would be um, they would invite somebody to participate in an experiment. So they would sit in front of a computer and talk to the computer by typing. Um, and they thought that the responses were by the computer. But in fact, it was a human in a, in a different room answering having that dialogue with, with that individual. So it's fooling the human into thinking that the computer is doing something when it's a human that's doing it instead. And so the value of using those techniques is that um, you can experiment with, let's say you're creating a chatbot, and you're not really sure you want to collect training data for the chatbot. Um, and so one way of doing that could be to do exactly this. You deploy the chatbot, and you People think that it's a computer, but it's actually a human doing it. And sometimes I wonder with a lot of the customer services that I use, whether they're human or not, right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's the Wizard of Oz techniques. User evaluations, basically you build something and then you make some variations and you show it to them, you do interviews and so on and so forth. And then A-B testing, is everyone familiar with A-B testing? Raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> Okay, so A-B testing, you, you basically, it's, it's a technique that's used in developing all kinds of products. It's not exclusive to the web or to, to technical entities, but you take something and you make two versions of it with a small variation and you put it out in the market. So you might have seen, for example, a magazine that you see in one shop and then you go to a different shop and the cover is different. And you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. So they'll do two versions of it and then see which one sells more. And so you, you do that on the web and if you have um, a lot of traffic to your website, you can collect a lot of data very quickly and confirm some, hy some hy hypotheses. Um, I'm not gonna play the video, but what I wanted to say here, I don't think, well, I don't know if it'll, it'll play, is, let's see, yeah. That we're, we're really good at adapting to bad technology, and what happens in this video is this woman is typing and then she moves it to the left as if we're a typewriter and the, the monitor falls to the, to the ground. We're really good at um, adapting to bad technology. And that's also really important to, to, to keep in mind because it's related to what I said earlier. It's not just about computers and AI, it's about humans and how we change the way we work and what we do and how that communication between the two things happens. Um, there are a few really interesting books by Nicholas Carr where he talks about how Google has changed our brains and how we don't read anymore. And it's not just Google, but you know, it's in general, um, the web. You know, we're getting used to short snippets of text. It's very hard for, for people now to, to read entire long articles. So our brain is changing because of technology. So um, just to give you some examples of stuff now, I'm gonna dive in a little bit, um, fairly high level. When I was at Yahoo, and most of these are from, from my time at, at Yahoo, we did a lot of A-B testing. So you know, again, an example, we didn't do that, but you know, you could say, you know, what if we turned the Yahoo logo to be uh, green instead of purple, and let's see if we get more visitors. So in this particular experiment, this, this page is from last night, by the way, so it's not, uh, but if you go to Yahoo today even, when you scroll down, the, the stuff on the right sort of hangs there. It doesn't disappear, whereas everything else scrolls up, scrolls up right? And so, um, we didn't have this at Yahoo when I was there, so I noticed that the space on the right, when you would scroll down the page, all of the text would go up, so this, the space on the right would be wasted. So I was like, why don't we do something to keep stuff there and see what happens? Like, let's see if clicks increase and if people, you know, uh, place more, more attention on, on, those, on those components. So we call these floating boxes. And so what we did was that. As you scroll down, then those boxes on the right would stick. And, and that's still a, in, being used today at Yahoo. Um, and so we did a bunch of experiments, right? And the first one was just do that. Like, you know, the, the, the original website, when you scroll down, everything would go up. The experiment was the stuff on the right would stay there as you went up. What happened? The CTR, 
the click-through rate, which is a huge metric because it tells you basically how much money you're going to make. It's really, really important. Went up, in some cases, by 50%. I mean, this is millions and millions and millions of dollars over time, right? And so we continue doing more experiments. And, you know, changing the color of the boxes and so on and so forth. And so um, there are, in eye tracking, it's well known that the visual system tends to navigate towards the areas that are areas that are salient or unique. So one of the experiments we did was, and we had a simulator that would take the page and, and generate a heat map, heat map that simulated eye movements. So we knew, based on that um, and, and research and eye tracking, that something like what you see there is more salient and then people look at it more. So we changed the background color of some of these boxes with the text like on the top, but we changed the background color. And I thought, now it's gonna really, like, if we got 50%, you know, just by having these boxes there, if we change the background color to a light blue or whatever, it's gonna go like that. Guess what happened? Anybody? It went down, really significantly. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> it didn't make any sense. But then, and we, never, we were never, never able to confirm this hypothesis, but the hypothesis was, and still is, that it looked like an ad. And so people automatically ignored it. And, and the, the interesting thing is, if you look at Google search results today, and Yahoo search results today, and if you've tracked them over time, earlier on, they were really salient, the ones that were sponsored search. And then they tried to blend them in as much as possible, and then you know the regulators came in and said, you can't, do that. You can't make them look too much like organic search results because you're, you're tricking people. And most of us, including me, I mean, I automatically skip. Like, as soon as I see ad, I skip. So, so again, you have to take into account humans and how they behave and how that behavior changes based on how we condition them. So that was the, the purpose of that example in terms of design, right? Algorithmic. And I'm going to have to go a bit quicker now. Um, we did some work on creativity, on specifically took, taking Vine videos, which were, um, I think, 30-second videos, I forgot how long they were, um, for a service that was bought by Twitter. And so the question was, can we automatically, can we build an algorithm to automatically classify videos into creative and non-creative? So again, you know, the reason that I'm pointing out this example is because it's one of those things where you have to start with a question. What is creativity? And so we started by looking at philosophy and saying, well, what have humans said about creativity? What is creativity? How do we define a creative video? How can we build an algorithm if we don't even know what it is? So that's how the project started. And then we came up with a definition which is there and you know, there's a, a research paper that you can read if you're interested. And then we went to the next step which was, okay, now let's do some crowdsourcing. Let's get people to annotate these videos and tell us which ones are not. There, there were six, six seconds whether these videos are creative or not. So humans helped us create the data set. And again, this is really, really important because even though we're using machine learning, we need a data set and we need to think really hard about how we're building that data set. How is it being annotated? What instructions do we give the annotators? Is really, really important. So we found, you know, decent agreement and, and at the time we didn't use deep learning, so we built the features by hand, but that process of crowdsourcing helped us identify what types of features were relevant. So then we manually designed the features around different groups of, we, we grouped them, filmmaking, scene, composition, visual, audio, and so, and so on and so forth. And then we had to f define novelty, like what does that mean in a mathematical sense, right? And so this goes back to what I was saying earlier. So we found that, yeah, things that are too far, they're an outlier, you're not creative, you're just weird, right? No one's interested in you if you're too weird. You have to be edgy, you know, like somewhere in between uh, different but not too different. And, and the other thing that's really interesting about this, and you see this in fashion and in culture in general, is you, you be, you, you're a little weird and then other people become weird with you and then everything moves, right? Like, like fashion, it, it moves and it moves up and down different socioeconomic statuses. So anyway, you know, we, we did the work, we're fairly successful in the classification, uh, around 80% and so on and so forth. Another project, video tagging. Um, this one was using deep learning. There's obviously one thing missing in, this, in the label set. If you haven't noticed, there's no girl label. 
But the point that I wanted to make here is similar to the one that Johannes made, and it's, um, you know, we talk about video understanding, image understanding, but all we're doing is labeling, right? And that's really far away from actually understanding. Like if you give that picture to a, to a five-year-old, they can tell you a lot of stuff. If you give it to the computer, it may generate a sentence and says there's a feline and a girl, right? And furthermore, again, if you look at humans, like in, in these experiments, this is somebody else's work, they took background and foregrounds and they changed it and they found that humans had trouble recognizing the foreground objects when you change the background. So they would confuse a football player with a priest, which is pretty fascinating, right? And so what we need in terms of machine learning applied to these kinds of problems where we talk about understanding is a reasoning layer. And we're not doing enough work there yet. You know, we're very focused on just labeling, labeling. Deep learning, a lot of it is about labeling. And yeah, of course, there's a lot of work on reinforcement learning and, uh, you know, um, but, but I think that's one of the areas in which we'll need to do a lot more. And again, going back to what Johannes said, knowledge, knowledge bases will become really critical. Another example of kind of work we did, you know, trying to find highlights, automatically find highlights. Again, it's not just a, an algorithmic problem. You need to understand what humans consider to be important highlights, right? and what they consider to be funny and creative and unique. So understanding humans is really at the core of what we need to do if we want to build better AI and machine learning. And so one of the interesting things again is that knowing what to index if you're just doing, if you're doing indexing for search is the most critical issue. You can't just throw it all at the machine. You need to know what, you know, how it's going to be used. Um, how do you match that to user interests, aesthetics and creativity? How do you build those training sets? The next area is user insights, and I'm going a little bit over, over my time, I think, but maybe it's okay since I'm only holding you back from coffee. <laughs> so you, you, you're free to kill me after this if you don't have enough time for coffee. Um, so web search. So user behavior, right? So in this particular, we did a lot of this kind of work, and it's not necessarily machine learning, you know, it was basic clustering. But it's interesting nonetheless, you know, we took a ton of users um, and then we mixed their search data with census data to aggregate that analysis and to get a better understanding of what search users were, were doing and then we clustered them, we found some categories which were pretty interesting. You know, we, we created the names and, and, and these were f facts we found in, in the data, right? So I'm not going to go into all of the details. Um, and then we started looking at what we called information flows, which were what I, what I said earlier about socioeconomic patterns, right? So if you look at um, a large scale search system, like let's say Yahoo or Google, um, it can be a pretty good indicator of what's happening in society, right? And so we wanted to see if certain types of searches shifted from certain demographic groups to other demographic groups. So for example, when Sonia Sotomayor was elected um, to the Supreme Court, we found that, you know, initially only Hispanic people searched for her name. When she was nominated, everybody was searching for her, and then only Hispanics. With movies, the pattern is more like usually young people, then everybody, and then everybody. So there are changes. And so one of the applications of this could be, for example, if there's a new AIDS vaccine and we can know who's searching, then we know who's not maybe aware of it, right? So there are a lot of opportunities at the macro level in terms of policy and so on and so forth. Then we took that and we built a product which was called Yahoo Clues that gave you insights on search and trends and, you know, demographics. Uh, so this, this product was alive for a few years and um, one of our CEOs came in and said, search is not important anymore, they killed it. And then they said, search is really important again, but it was too late, it was already dead. Um, but anyway, again, insights on, on behavior and understanding how people search. And in that particular case, it was pretty interesting because like for Angelina Jolie, we found that both men and women search, whereas someone like M Megan Fox, it was mainly men. And again, hypotheses, like why is that? And you know, I thought, well, you know, Megan Fox is a very attractive woman, Angelina Jolie is too, but Angelina Jolie does a lot of work outside of acting like she's, you know, UN ambassador and so she's more of a role model whereas Megan Fox is maybe not as visible in doing whatever else she does besides you know, acting or, or so on and so forth. So a lot of interesting stuff. Looking at news patterns and consumptions. 
again, the way we behave changes over time, day by day, hour by hour, and so on and so forth. Um, we did another project where we looked at left and right leaning searches. This was for the elections back in 2012, yeah. And so we're able to um, classify searches into left and right leaning. And then we built a visualization for this for a blog at Yahoo, which is called The Signal. And in doing this, you know, we started, the idea was to do this automatically. So we started analyzing queries. And this is an example of the same query written many different ways. Another one. And yet another one. And yet another one. And so when we started looking at this, we realized like this is actually, like we started with a, a paper, a research paper that Ingmar, my colleague who, who, who did this work, um, had done on, on classifying queries into left and right leaning. When we went to put this in production, it was amazing how many challenges we came up with or we found. You know, like how do we group all of these queries that look kind of the same? Um, what's the right level? Which categories? How do you automate it? Noise, freshness, interest, interestingness. Not all of them are going to be interesting. Interaction interpretation. And then you start getting into realizing like, oh, we need all of these other fields. Like we need an LP too. We need entity recognition. We need to change the design. We looked at uh, image search, a large scale study on image search. The same thing. You know, we realized building the algorithms to classify and apply machine learning and label the images is not enough. We need to understand users, what they do, what do they search for, which categories, scalability and labeling, noise, freshness, and diversity, accuracy. And for that particular problem, we realized we need to learn more about cognitive psychology, library sciences, HCI, information retrieval, multimedia, engineering. So it's less about the data, it's even less about the algorithms. A lot of it is about behavior, understanding, interaction and design are really key elements to be able to succeed in, in deploying these things in production in actual systems to get to users, you need to segment, experiment, iterate, innovate within a context. So a lot of it is about behavior. In terms of doing this at a company, I would say, you know, it has to be strategic, top down, but it also has to be exploratory, bottom up. You need to have the right metrics, do a lot of A-B testing, and a strong human and interdisciplinary focus. What's the next frontier? As I said at the beginning, small data, that's why my Twitter handle is tiny big data. Um, and by that I mean the data about ourselves. You know, like we generate a lot of data individually that we're not using in any way. You know, just eye blinking, we blink our eyes 100,000 times a day, approximately. And I'm sure there's some information in, in those blinks, you know, maybe health information, I don't know, right? There's a lot of data that we're not using. So I think. Um, that's a really interesting direction where in the future, like, you know, we have these devices now that just give us some plots of, on stuff, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, the ch key challenges with that is, and, you know, a, a really key question is what is the value of a lot of that information? And we struggle with that today, right? With all the emails we get, the websites we visit, all the texts we're getting, what is the value of the information? How do we represent social structure, right? Um, you know, Facebook is great, LinkedIn is great. But that's a very, very basic representation of wh who we are as a society, socially. So how do we do that? What does interaction in that space mean? And in a social sense, and how do we transfer that? The same with transfer and effect. And this goes back to you know, like influences in social media. What does that mean? These are really deep questions that we have not answered. The role of technology over time has increasingly been more and more important. And I would argue that now we're very much at the, at the very edge. I'm, I think I'm getting kicked out, but I have like maybe five more slides. The role of data is also increasing very quickly. And the role of, of culture seems to be decreasing. Um, so the point that I wanted to get across is, you know, it's assumed that computing technologies are culturally neutral, but they're not. And it's really, really important that we keep that in mind and we keep diversity in mind and we don't just let Silicon Valley dictate who we are and what we do everywhere. Um, technology that does have this tendency to, to discretize culture. So know your, your, news, your, news, your users, what they do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Future applications, I said, I think a lot of personalized technologies will, will come into play, especially in healthcare, education, what I call companionship, which you know, can be robots, can be anything that help us feel more connected to other people or to machines. Intelligent architecture, fabrics, micro devices, Integration with biology, 
cells, food production, behavior, data everywhere. I mean, there's already data everywhere, but I'm thinking data in, in the chairs, in your shoes, really, really in the buildings, really, really everywhere. Um, and that's it. Um, so thank you very much. There was one slide that I took out at the end because of time um, on Maslow's primitive needs, and I encourage everyone to look at it because I think that's also really fascinating to look at and, and figure out what needs are we satisfying and what needs is AI and, and what needs is machine learning going to fulfill in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. And thanks for bringing also this new perspective on the definition of artificial intelligence. Very, very inspiring and Thank interesting. You.